Hebrews chapter 2, we got into it last week. We've been walking through the book. It is uh, a book that has been explaining so far who Jesus is to a group of new Jewish converts who come out of the Second Temple Judaism. And he's explaining that this Jesus and this message is greater than anything. He is supreme. Lord Jesus is the preeminence of the Lord Jesus because he starts to talk about that the, the law given by the angels. And we saw in different passages, the Second Temple Jews believed that the law was given them directly by angels themselves. And he starts making the argument that Jesus is more important than the angels. Big deal to those people. We read it and we go, well, yeah. But to them, that was a great big deal. He says he's greater than all of these other things, greater than creation because he created everything and everything is sustained by him. He's greater than you. He's greater than anything else. It's all about the Lord Jesus. And then we get into chapter 2, and we'll just start reading it, verse 1 through 4. And I know that's where I left off last time, but we're going to hit a little further. We must, therefore, pay even more attention. So this Jesus, therefore, what is the therefore, therefore? All that stuff I just told you. We must, therefore, because Jesus is supreme, pay even more attention to what we have heard so that we will not drift away. What we have heard, they have heard and received the gospel. Verse 2. For if the message spoken through angels was legally binding talking about the law. Remember in chapter 1, the angels gave the law, and it is legally binding. It's like a bunch of lawyers, you know, and say, ah, we got you. It's legally binding. These are the rules. These are the laws. And every transgression and disobedience received a just punishment. Not, nothing's unjust in any punishment from God. This is a just punishment. So if the law is all that, how will we escape if we, how will we escape if we? Again, the writer, the pastor of these people, he's saying, me too, all of us together. Nobody's on a pedestal here. How will we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? What is salvation? Lord Jesus, all of that was laid out for us. It was first spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. These are the witnesses. This is where we're going to get into the last of verse 3 and the, the verse 4 itself. So the witnesses, those who heard. Now we go to verse 4. At the same time, God also testified by signs and wonders, various miracles and distributions of gifts from the Holy Spirit according to his will. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we pray that you take the words here and allow us to best understand them and what to do with them. God, I pray that you bless the preaching of your word in Jesus' name. Amen. So our salvation, if you have received salvation from the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have put your faith in him, salvation itself is an indescribable great gift from God because it comes to us from none other than the eternal Son of God Himself who is at the right hand of the Father. When He said it is finished, He accomplished His mission when He came upon this earth and became a human like us. 100% man, 100% God. So, that salvation, Jesus' salvation Himself, His announcement of the good news is giving through the earthly ministry that he has. That's what we get in verse 3. Go back to verse 3, please. How we escape if we neglect such a great salvation. It was first spoken by the Lord. So here we go from the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard it. Talking about the apostles. So the apostles teaching and preaching is confirming the things that Jesus taught them. And we get this announcement, this great earthly ministry that tells us how to be saved, what salvation is. And we go, well, what do I need to be saved from? I shared with y'all when I first started going to church, you know, everybody's like, you need to be saved. You need to be saved from what? I had no idea what y'all were talking about, you know. And I say, y'all, it wasn't here. 
But the church itself kept saved, saved, saved. I was fine. I didn't need anything. I didn't think I did. But it's not until you understand your urgent need and what this is to deliver you from and why Jesus came and did all this stuff. So having offered himself, Jesus giving himself as the ultimate sacrifice for your sins and mine. All right? And now he is back at the right hand of God. I want to emphasize that word back because a lot of us have the idea in the church that Jesus, because he came and lived a sinless life and died for the sins of the world and then resurrected and ascended to the right hand of the Father, he earned the right through what he did to sit at the right hand of the Father. And as we've been seeing in chapter 1, he didn't earn the right. He always had the authority and the power. It was his seat to begin with, and he just took it back. So he's back at the right hand of the Father. And what is he waiting on? Same thing you and I are waiting on. Chapter 1, verse 13. Now to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool? The authority, everything has been done. Everything has been accomplished. He has died for the sins of the world. He has laid down his life. He has defeated death. He took the keys to death in Hades. He is at the right hand of the Father. Why then am I being tormented by evil forces? Why then do I succumb to the flesh that I dwell in? Why am I having to deal with a sinful age, a sinful world? Why am I depressed every time I cut on the news? How come every day I hear about somebody killing somebody and I see all all this bad stuff going on because this last part has not happened yet the sentence has been given but it has not been executed yet so we live in a time where we talked about we're waiting for the other shoe to drop that's the time we find ourselves it's all done the enemy the devil everybody they know they have been defeated they know they have been judged they are scrambling and working really hard for the remaining time they have before they are locked up before they are judged before they are cast into what the revelation book calls the lake of fire that was prepared for the devil and his angels all of that we're waiting for. So how can we, how can we escape such great a salvation? Verse 3 is telling us. If to hear this gospel news and this good message, then you say, well, I need proof. Okay. Well, the proof is in the text. Salvation is great because the witnesses. Go back to verse 3 at the very end of it, of chapter 2, please. The witnesses that are there. So it was first spoken to by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. Now go into verse 4, please. At the same time, God also testified by signs and wonders and various miracles and then the rest. All right. The proof. So salvation is only great if it's true. Okay. If this whole thing is just some made up stuff. And I spent a lot of my life believing this was all just made up stuff by a bunch of, you know, um, people that are trying to tell us that, that we need to live a certain way and control how we think and control how we do. And just a bunch of religious leaders coming up with all this stuff. Listen, if it isn't real, it doesn't work. What are we trying to be saved from? It's, well, there's some examples in Hebrews, Hebrews 10, 34. For you sympathized with the prisoners and accepted the joy, the confiscation of your possessions, knowing that you yourselves have a better and enduring possession. Here's what was happening when this was written to the, the people of the Hebrews, um, the letter was addressed to. They were starting to get persecuted. They came to be believers, and now the government... And other people are persecuting them. And this last part, they, they're doing real good right now. Doing pretty good. So far, so good. Because the government's taking their possessions. Taking their livelihoods. Taking their jobs. And they're going, we don't care. We've got a better inheritance when we leave this world. You see... A lot of times the evidence of your faith is the fact that you will face persecution and thrive in the midst of it, even though, because you know the salvation you have received. You have received the Lord Jesus, and you know you have an inheritance beyond this world, and this world is not all there is. And they can take my job. They can take my home. They can take every material thing from me. I don't care. When I die, I'm going to be with Jesus. But 
he's warning them because more is to come. That comes in later in the book, chapter 12, verse 4. And he's letting them know, you better cling to the Lord Jesus because things are fixing to get bad, you new Christians. In struggling against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. He's letting them know, God is warning these people, some of you are going to start to die. It's not enough anymore to take your possessions. Because what did they do? They hate the message of Jesus. So those in power tried to shut up the message of Jesus and stop it from spreading. So what did they do to those new believers, those Second Temple Jewish believers who came to know Jesus as their Savior, as the Messiah? They tried to shut them up by taking their possessions, taking their home, taking their livelihoods. Taking, and that's not working. The gospel is spreading. People are getting saved. These people are not being thwarted at all by these uh, tactics. So next thing you got to do, you got to start killing some of them. If it was all a lie and we were all making it up and we were all going, no, 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 I, I, I just made up seeing them resurrected. I never actually did. I just made up that salvation experience I had. I just made all that up. This is the time to start telling the truth then. Right before they cut your head off. Right before they feed you to lions. Right before they burn you alive. That's the time to say, I was joking. We took this way too far. Y'all are right. How dare we? I'm sorry that we led so many people astray. But they did not. They went and faced martyrdom and death. And in some cases, they even ridiculed the people who were torturing them to death. So what else you got? One of the early church fathers said, I'm done on this side, flip me over. Tougher than me. People went singing hymns as they marched to the lions. What gives you the power to do those things in the face of horrible death? The Holy Spirit of God because of the salvation of Jesus Christ. They were able to face martyrdom. And this is some of the evidence that is before us. And in verse 3, it says in chapter 2, declared at first spoken by the Lord and attested to those who heard, confirmed. People hearing it, people facing persecution. I know some of us would fold if we had to lose our jobs over Jesus, much less our homes. Hearing it, persecuted, put to death, confirming that this gospel message must be true. And if it's not true, I think it warrants some investigation, folks, and not just cast it aside as if this isn't something that's possible. People died believing it to the bitter end. You say, well, people can die for a lie. People flew airplanes into Twin Towers for a lie. No, that's dying for a lie that you were told and you began to believe. These are people and witnesses that saw things happen and saw the Lord Jesus resurrected. The gospel is not the best ideas of a bunch of religious philosophers. A bunch of Jews moving into... Greek territory didn't sit down and come up with a philosophy to take all your fun away. That's the way we act. That this gospel message just makes life no fun. This message is a matter of revelation. It's a matter of God revealing himself to us. God taking the time to let us know a little more about him. If that's what it is, then it's special, right? Because God doesn't have to do that. So his teachings and his miracles are recorded in the Gospels. He died on the cross. He was raised physically. And like 500 people saw him ascend. People ate with him, hung out with him, were with him. And folks, all they had to do was provide the body to shut everybody up. 500 people saying, we all had a mass hallucination, and we saw it. No, I, I did a few drugs in my day. We don't hallucinate the same thing together. It's a separate hallucination. Your hallucination is your hallucination. I don't join in on that. My brain is my brain. Yours is yours. It's simple. They saw something. 
And all the Roman Empire had to do was go, here he is, dead. And everybody would have had to shut up. That's not what happened, though. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 3 through 8. Oh, I didn't tell you about that one. I just had an idea. Keith, hang with me. Y'all give Brother Keith a minute. Don't look at him with, with an ugly eye. Yeah, 15, 3 through 8. I'm going to make this as hard as I can, Keith. I'm going to say the wrong verses that I didn't even give you. In these verses, we're going to see how important witnesses are. For I passed on to you as most important what I also received from Christ. Received. So Paul is saying, basically Paul is about to give us the whole gospel in a nutshell. Okay? Okay. That Christ died, that's part of the gospel, for our sins. Everybody's like, well, Jesus came to be a good teacher. If he came to be a good teacher, he didn't have to die for your sins, okay? Somebody had to die for your sins. According to the scriptures, verse 4, that he was buried, that's the next part of the gospel, and that he was raised, the resurrection. We're, we're, man, we, this is Easter right here, man. And on the third day, according to the scriptures, all that happened. Then... There's another part that we don't think about that is part of the gospel. The witnesses. The witnesses. He appeared to Cephas, which is Peter. Then to the twelve, verse six. Then he appeared to over 500, how did you make that up? Brothers at one time, most of whom remain in the present. They still alive, but some of them have died. Then he appeared to James. Then... To all the apostles, in verse 8. Last of all, Paul says, as to one, um, he, he's being humble here, abnormally born, he appeared to me. Meaning, I, was, I came later, I wasn't one of the main guys, I show up later in the book. Alright, over and over, you're, if you got the King James or another version, it says, he was seen by this, seen by this, seen by this one, seen by this one, seen by this one. It is not by accident that the appearances that we all just looked at in these verses show up with a nutshell explanation of what the gospel is. Because the witnesses are just as important as the event itself because they bear witness to the truth behind the resurrection and ascension of the Lord Jesus and the gospel message for your salvation. How can you believe in something if there's no witnesses? How can you believe in something if there's no testimony of it? If, I get, if, I, if somebody murders somebody and nobody's there to see it, it's a whole lot harder to prove who did it than if you've got 500 witnesses going, He did it! Many witnesses saw these things, and a lot of them wrote it down. All right. These witnesses... Something else happened for them. One, we got people that are having power in the face of persecution and martyrdom. One, we've got the testimony coming out in the writings. But now, look at verse 4 of chapter 2. Back at Hebrews. At the same time, God also testified by signs and wonders and various miracles. And Baptists all closed their Bibles right then. Um, distribution of gifts from the Holy Spirit according to his will. I don't know why Baptists are so afraid of these things. I, I don't understand. I preached on these things in one church, and a guy said, I've been in Baptist church my whole life and never heard these things. Have you read your Bible? I don't know what to tell you. It's there. What's going on? He's referring to miracles that were performed mostly by the apostles this is a reference to the book of Acts. You go to the book of Acts, you can read about all these miracles and things. So all of this stuff is being done by the witnesses of Jesus' resurrection and teaching. So God confirms through the witnesses by giving them power and gifts to perform miracles and signs and wonders. We don't often think about the purpose of Miracles and signs and wonders. Every bit of it has a purpose. The term signs, wonders, and miracles all mean the same thing. Um, they're all synonymous, but they are uh, different nuances of the same thing. Let me explain. 
signs point to the fact that miracles have a spiritual significance. If somebody's performing a miracle in the name of God, that's a spiritual thing. All right? When the lame man was healed and the dead man was raised, it points to something beyond the fact that God just wanted to heal this guy. There's a powerful spiritual significance to that. Jesus going around doing miracles, that was a sign to everybody, hey, God is on this man's side. Nobody can do what he does except God be with him. So perhaps we are to listen when he starts teaching to us about how to live. I mean, the guy that can go and heal the blind is worth listening to. Even if he said, you have ears, but you hear not. You have eyes, but you see not. So it's God in heaven confirming through the Lord Jesus his message is true. So when Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father, the Holy Spirit comes as a comforter to those that are grieving and missing him and gives them some of the same powers, confirming to the witnesses to say to the lost and dying world, here is my message. You say, well, I've heard sermons about how God wants everybody to be healed and God wants everybody to be wealthy and God wants everybody to be blessed. Folks, if you read your Bible, there were times Jesus walked over crippled people to go heal a certain crippled person. You say, well, they didn't have enough faith. Well, let me ask you, how much faith does a dead man have? Many of the people he healed didn't even know who he was. Who healed you? I don't know. Would you like to go find them so you can worship them too? So all these things start to unfold. Signs are pointing that. The word wonders emphasizes the human response. Where when we see the sign of this spiritual miracle happening before us, we are in awe. And so, I see some fading. One of my favorite messages in the Bible is when Paul is preaching and teaching. And apparently... Paul had been preaching and teaching and preaching and teaching and preaching and teaching. And this boy fell asleep and fell out the window and died. And everybody said, that's the most boring preacher we ever had. He done killed somebody. Some of y'all just look like I killed you when I got done. I ain't even killed y'all. What did Paul go do? Brought him back to life. And everybody said, I'm going to wake up. I might already start listening. No offense, Larry. I know I look dead at you, but I didn't mean anything about it. I'm going to start paying attention to this man who has the power and the authority to bring this young man back to life. See, the miracles always had a purpose. The gospel message is so important that the power of God goes with it before it through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why, even today we hear of things happening in Africa, China. We hear of things happening in Saudi Arabia, uh, Iran, Iraq. Miracles still happening today because those are areas the gospel message has to be taken out. The wonders, and then it talks about various miracles so, various miracles here is, talk, is a word in the Greek where dynamus, which where they get their word for dynamite, but don't let anybody, this is not how you do Greek. You don't go, the gospel message is the power, like an explosion of dynamite. Yeah, I've heard all those sermons. No, that word was given before the dynamite was created. It's, it's just a word for power that is talking about what God has done. That's why that's there. The gifts of the Holy Spirit... According to verse 4, are, are, not, are given out, distributed by the according of the will of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God decides who gets what gift. Okay, There's two groups today. Many claim that the church should receive and exercise the miracle of gifts even today to the extent of what we read in that book of Acts. God... I'd be fine with that. I prayed and prayed to be able to do. If I, had to, if I had the gift of healing, I wouldn't hold a crusade. I'd be heading straight to Children's Hospital. I'd be going in every, every, every ward, every hospital, every place I could get in if I had that. I don't understand why all of a sudden we've got to have this big coliseum and everybody's got to come pay me a bunch of money for me to heal them. There's a problem there, folks. A lot of money, follow the money. 
some people say, well, we should all have that. And if you don't have that existence of miracles and gifts and speaking in tongues and all of that today, then your church is dead and you're most likely lost because it's right there in the book of Acts. Well, to the same extent, others argue that these gifts that we're talking about basically um, went away after the New Testament, um, the, the canon of the New Testament was put together and you received the Bible and then the gifts ceased at that time and they are all gone. There's a whole belief and teaching of that too. I don't jihad with either one of those personally. You can if you want to. And if you, somebody says, well, I do this, I'd be glad to have a conversation with you about it, just not today. But I would love to talk about it. Here's what everybody seems to overlooking, the emphasis of the gifts and the purpose of the gifts. Every time the gifts were given by the, the will of the Holy Spirit to certain individuals to perform and do certain tasks, it always had a purpose in glorifying God and spreading the gospel message. I thought God just wanted me healed to glorify his name and spread that gospel message. Past things are not present things. All right. When the writer of Hebrews says these things in verse 4 that we were looking at, in verse 4, um, he is saying to us, these things happened in the past. See, the, the, the crazy thing is, it appears that in the life of Paul, and by the time the book of Hebrews was written, a lot of these miracles and this power was already fading. You say, where's your evidence for that? Well, in um, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 23, you don't have to pull it up, brother. Y'all can jot it down. Timothy, uh, like a son to Paul. Paul loves Timothy, spiritual son. Timothy's sick, man. Timothy's having problems. Did Paul say, you know, there was a time I had this handkerchief thing, and I blessed it, and I passed it on, and sick people became well. Timothy, here's your handkerchief. Just go and hold it and you'll be healed. He told them, said, no, get you a little wine. Get you a little wine for medicinal purposes and drink that for your stomach. Apparently, the church had given Timothy ulcers, I understand. And he didn't heal them and he didn't perform a miracle. He just told them, go get you some medicine. Go take your Pepto-Bismol and get back to work. Not only him, but in the Bible, we see a little while later in um, for. 1 Timothy chapter, 2 Timothy chapter 4, that um, Trophimus was very sick to the point of death, and Paul didn't heal him. Paul didn't say, hey, if you send me a, if you sow a seed into my ministry, I'll give you this handkerchief and you'll be healed. Oh, Paul didn't even heal the man. He left him there in the city to die. Did they have a lack of faith? Maybe that was what it was. Really? Timothy? That guy, a lack of faith that couldn't be healed, but a little wine and a little bit of just lay over there and hopefully you get better? I mean, really? No, 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 no. See, that's what we're told. If you, do, if you come to somebody and you need to be healed, the problem is you didn't get healed because you didn't have enough faith. No, these things were happening in the book of Acts, and these things still happen from time to time today, but it's not prominent like it was, and the Holy Spirit decides who gets what gift. Now... When you hear about spiritual gifts, I know that we all go to speaking in tongues. And if I was a good Baptist preacher, I'd skip right over it and keep on going, but I'm not. And we all know that. So, let's talk about spiritual gifts. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 27 through 34. Like I said, if you're in your Bible, don't worry about flipping around. Just write it down next to Hebrews. You can write in your Bible. Verse 27, if any person speaks in another language, there should be only two, or at least most three, each taking a turn, someone must interpret. This is in church. He is giving, believe it or not, Paul says we need to be orderly in church. We don't need chaos in church. We don't need people running around, barking and crawling and rolling around on the floor. We don't need all that. We need order in the church. So he brings order. And in the church, 
lot of people were getting out of hand and very prideful about their gift of speaking in tongues. So he says, all right, these are some things we got to do. So we're not going to have a bunch of people speaking in tongues at the same time. And one, two, maybe, maybe three. Someone has to be here to interpret it. Next verse. But if there is no interpreter, that person should keep silent in the church and speak to himself and to God. Now, I have seen, and I, 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 the little bit of church that I got was in holiness, congregation, um, very charismatic. I loved the church, loved the pastor, loved everybody. I was a little kid, and speaking in tongues didn't bother me at all. Every little church I got was speaking in tongues. But I never saw an interpreter I never saw it done in an orderly way. It's just people would jump up and start doing it. Next verse. I know there are those that do it in order, by the way. Two or three prophets should speak, and the others should evaluate. So somebody gets up, speaks in tongues. Somebody else needs to be able to interpret it. Okay? Verse. Next verse. Okay. But if someone has been revealed to another person sitting there, the first prophet should be silent. So we don't need everybody talking. We try to have church. Next verse. For you can all prophesy one by one so that everyone may learn and everyone may be encouraged. And the prophet's spirits are under the control of the prophets. Since God is not a God of disorder, see, orderly church service, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. The woman should be silent in church. So after I got saved in my 20s, I started going to a church that was basically independent Baptist. And guess what? The women weren't allowed to talk. It was amazing. Business meeting, they couldn't even speak in business meeting. And somebody would always, a woman would say, well, why can't I talk in business meeting? They'd bring up this verse. Out of context. I want you to know, ladies, you have a voice. You can speak in the church. And we're usually happy when you do. But in the context of this, what is the context? Speaking in tongues in the church service. The women are not supposed to do it. Folks, I'm going to tell you my experience with speaking in tongues in the church. If you shut up all the women in the church, speaking in tongues dies. Because they are the majority of the ones speaking in tongues in the church service. It's right there in the Bible, and it's universal for all services. And say, so, well, my experience is, what, what, what does the Bible say? What matters is what the Bible says on the subject. If somebody, if a woman came in here off the street and started speaking in tongues, I would tell her to sit down and be quiet. Not because I'm mean or a male chauvinist pig, but because that's what the Bible says. And she's trying to disrupt the service. And if a man got up and did it and nobody could interpret it, I'd tell him to shut up and sit down. Because there's an order in which we do things. Now, all of that being said, about women, remain, women remaining silent and everything, there's a, I know I'm running late, y'all just bear with me. It's, it's too good not to. Don't you want to know something? So the, 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 if you take the whole idea of the, there's a preaching today that if you do not speak in tongues, now, I'm not saying speaking in tongues is dead like some people. I think there's areas where it works. But you know what they're speaking? They're speaking another language. It's another language that someone else understands. That was the miracle at Pentecost, people, that when everybody started speaking in tongues, other guys over here that knew they didn't know my language, but I'm hearing him speak my language, and I'm hearing the gospel message, that's a miracle confirming the witnesses. It's one of the miracles. Also, if you want to get real deep, this is also what happened at the Tower of Babel when man was turning from God and God divided up the nations. He confounded their language and gave them all different languages and gave them over to other rulers and the whole world spoke different languages at that time. This is the Lord Jesus pulling all that back together, all the Gentiles, all everybody, because the gospel message is now being spoken and preaching in all different languages by people that don't even know the language they're speaking. It is a miracle of God bringing back together mankind under one message, Jesus Christ is salvation. 
That's the power and the authority of it all. So this idea that's being preached and taught in a lot of churches that if you cannot speak in tongues, that's evidence that you are not saved, is ludicrous, idiotic theology because we just saw in the text earlier where the Holy Spirit decides who gets what gift. And not everybody gets the same gift. Also, after the... While the book of Hebrews is being written and presented to Christians, the gifts are starting to fade away. They're going away. And so it wasn't until the 1900s this revival of speaking in tongues in America kicked back up. We're talking about Catholic, Orthodox, you know, all the way up to us. Nobody spoke in tongues for a really long time. So, some of it may be real, but some of it's just gibberish and is out of order with the Bible, and if it's out of order with the Bible, it's not of God. The Bible gave order to which it should be given. And if you say, well, I speak in tongues, and I, I have my own prayer language, and I speak in tongues, I would love to have an honest, real conversation with you about it, because I am thoroughly interested in that, and that is amazing to me. I got up here and I preached one Sunday about spiritual gifts and I had a man meet me at the back and say, that's all great, you did a wonderful job, but you left out part of it. I said, what did I leave out? He said, you left out speaking in tongues. I said, well, no, I didn't because it's not there. It didn't happen to be in the text I was preaching. So there's this idea that if we don't do it, we're not saved. I also notice there's a whole lot of pride that comes with it. Charismatic Magazine put out, uh, I was reading an article in Charismatic Magazine. I'm not trying to beat up on all Charismatics. Some of them are wonderful people. But Charismatic Magazine had an article that the missionaries going overseas could not get the new converts to speak in tongues. And they were, the whole article is about what do we do? They got to speak in tongues. But nobody wanted to speak in tongues. Tongues is languages, folks. If you learned their language and you went over there, in a sense, you are doing what it was. All that said, and I could go into it deeper and deeper. Because every person desperately needs salvation. God, through the power of Jesus, through the work of Jesus, through that gospel message, has offered you and me salvation and he has confirmed the authority and the power of the witnesses of that by giving them the power of signs and miracles and wonders so that you and I can sit back and evaluate is this real? Do I need salvation? But Jesus said, going back to Hebrews, I mean the writer of Hebrews said, Hebrews 2, 3 how will we escape? If God went through all of this trouble to get the message into our hearts and our minds, and you reject that message, his son shedding his blood, the power, the miracles, the witnesses, the martyrs, God does all this to get that message into your heart and into your mind, and you neglect it, how will you escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was first spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. Later in the book, he gives condemnation for those who reject this. We find terrifying things, Hebrews 10, 27. But a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire about to consume the adversaries. Who's that talking about? How will you escape? How will you escape if you neglect so great a salvation? There has to be consequences. So my, I close with this. If you evaluate yourself, evaluate your mind, evaluate your heart right now, have I neglected so great a salvation? Maybe this is worth exploring. Maybe this is worth listening to. Maybe I should seek. If this is truth and there's consequences for not receiving it, Maybe I should evaluate this honestly. Have you been saved? Have you been saved from what's to come?
Father, if anybody needs salvation today, if anybody needs to come to you, if anybody needs to give their lives over to you in this, I just pray that they will come and ask you for salvation. You don't have to come talk to me. You don't have to come pray in the altar. You can, you can pray where you are. Some of us, our knees don't bend like they used to and our backs hurt. And that doesn't stop us from praying, though. We're going to have, Larry's going to sing. We're not going to stand. With every head bowed, every eye closed, I'm going to give you some time. If you need to pray to the Lord Jesus while Larry sings, and you want to receive this salvation that he has offered, I pray that you do so. And when it's over, that you and I can have a conversation and talk about this. If you're sitting there and you go, I got loved ones that need Jesus, I have to pray for them right now. Hey, the altar is open for anybody at any time to come pray. Brother Larry, will you sing for us?